uh, somebody wants to have a reputation out of somewhere someone else work and commercial because it is uh, something that can be uh, uh, that can get a patent so um, I think that's the background how it can happen and how can how can we um, actually prevent it is to have one is to have a logbook I think logbook is one of the evidence who is the one doing it first and um, chronologically uh, the second thing is that um, we have a plagiarism software but we cannot check data I mean we do not have a database in terms of data so this is quite tricky and uh, um, I think uh, we discussed about an internal peer reviewer. So before the data come out somewhere else, I think uh, we can pass it through our um, scientific um, peer group and give, um, um, how to say that, give, 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 and they can give, give uh, suggestions, etc. Um, and one of the one of the idea is to have an independent board, uh, kind of research and development stuff, um, to deal with all the data before it is going out somewhere. And uh, for this case, um, I think the way out will be to retract the paper whenever it's possible. I think that's all we have, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think they're all valid points that were raised there. But the problem for this case was that uh, the investigation of the issue was that it was an inadvertent error in one of the papers. It wasn't, it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't deliberate mistake. It wasn't a deliberate mistake. It was an inadvertent mistake as a result of miscommunication within the laboratory about which data needed to be in which figure of the papers. So it was really a lack of control, lack of quality control in terms of the publications that were the result of the work. Um, and the issue of the research had commercial potential and so on, I've included that in the case because it's a red herring, as we say, it's a, it's a distractor. I wanted you to think about what, what all the issues might be in such a place and you and you naturally focus on the issue that there might be a conflict of interest around the commercial potential when in fact the whole basis of the problem was just an inadvertent error of uh, data being reproduced in two papers at the same time so, and that was unfortunate okay so happy to take any further comments on this particular one if necessary can I have one uh, advice from Professor yeah. Allen? So it happens in uh, maybe almost department. The data belongs to the department, of course, but then they will come and then they collect the data, uh, maybe doing small research and combine the data and it will be belongs to the student to uh, defense. So it's very common. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking about uh, when you are doing this kind of uh, research, of course it's not PhD student, but the data is very important. So we are trying to um, uh, create something like a key or password or what, whatever, yep. but it's very difficult to manage. Thank it you. is, yes, uh, and data retention and management is one of the most important aspects of all of these situations that we're dealing with. Uh, and that's why it's so prominent in the policies and procedures of many countries as well as institutions. So proper data management is essential. So they own the intellectual property as a student. When you're a staff member, the intellectual property is retained by the university uh, normally. Uh, but students own, own the intellectual property. But normally the process should be that anything which is published by the student should be signed off by their supervisor first as being a quality publication and the supervisor should be responsible for making sure that all the data are accurate 
and all the figures are accurate, etc., etc. So that's part of the training process of becoming a fully fledged researcher. Okay. Okay. So applause to Group Three, and now the last one, Group Four. Thanks to my professor about that, and this is the case for. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it patient that my our first in a discussion? Is it patient really come because the staff member said that there are no evidence that the human subject reported in the paper ever attended? So, firstly, uh, it could be a fabrication if the pa if the patient is not come. But the other things, if is it uh, the patient is really not come, is there is a false patient, so never come. So it is a fabrication. But the other thing is could be there is a, in a situation when the patient is really come for the first or second exam, but after that, uh, the, uh, the next exam, it be done in her, the patient home. For example, like a clinical patient. Uh, for example, I have a clinical patient with the shoe dermatitis. They come to the surgical hospital and they have an examination, but after the PET test, they doesn't want to go to the surgical hospital because of the uh, distance. And then we go there to their house. This is difficult. It is different situation. And in the case if the patient is not real patient, this fabrication, and why? Where it's happened is because maybe there is no supervision and maybe there is the system, there is no SOP, so standard operating procedure in this department is not good and there is of lack of integrity of the researchers and also the permissible system, so sometimes the unfair system. So because it is a senior, so is it permissive because it is a seniors? And okay, you already have a SOP, but because the senior is not obey, is it okay? But if it's Mira not obey, it will be punished very hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the other thing about the data management and uh, data management, and then case report form, and then informed consent, and firstly has to be being investigated. But in our situ situation, there is still not a good data management because every department have a data, their own data management in the hospital, and even inside the department, there are many data management system. So maybe me and Mira have a different data management. So it has to be not like that because uh, the system is uh, everybody has to upload it, the data into the university hospital system and there is a certain uh, uh, like authorization who, who can be open the data and everything so it has to be the same and it has to be a backup system why we say about the backup system because if in the traditional data management system there is uh, always can be a loss of data so in, in our case it could be uh, should you matter this patient? Uh, eh, this patient is already come. I'm, I'm sure they're coming about seven o'clock in the morning, so there are no people see this patient. But uh, they, they already taken the photograph by Mr. X. But there is, where is the data? Oh, there is no data because at that time the Mr. X has lost the data for certain months. It, it's happened here, and and this is Miras, true. <laughs> And then Mira <laughs> again, because it's a department. And then and so that's why there has to be a system supervision and pick up system. So if the data and this computer loss has to be uploaded in a Dropbox or iCloud, something like that. But it's, it is in, in here. But in a, in a or is it a developed country it has to be in uh, cannot be happen like that <laughs> because the data even I can retract the data from 1935. In the Netherlands, and the patient who come to my university a hospital in the Netherlands, even 1935, and then research conduct advisor. I think yeah, this is an interesting point about the research conduct advisor, because uh, it has to be the EC people it has to be contact and appoint, appointed by the faculty, and uh, he has to be competent on the job, and we also. Uh, four of us doesn't know whether there is a re uh, research conduct uh, advisor. So maybe Buut can uh, explain to us. And then uh, the <laughs> five is a training on research conduct and ethics to students and researchers. And I think the training of research conduct and ethics is already done, but I don't think so. It can be already spread to everybody, and especially like a mentor, uh, uh, because you mentioned about the mentor 
mentor tutorial eh, tutorial workshop for the mentor I think is important because mm. if the young uh, staff already know everything about the research conduct if the seniors doesn't know so it will be we have a different perception and the six uh, about the punishment system so we have to be in the beginning we have to be uh, agree so the faculty or the university hospital has to have the same uh, mission that if there is uh, the peop uh, and the if if there is a uh, Enforcement and there would be a punishment and what kind of punishment has to be no before something like that But I think it will be better because the the, the problem is occur not a long time ago So we, we just develop so we will develop a better and better uh, system and uh, Thank you very much and number four question from us. Maybe two can be Thank you um, <laughs> Yeah, if you ask if there is a research Misconduct officer, then the answer is no. So guideline for developing research misconduct policy. And the part which they have a description on research misconduct is more of the uh, describing the understanding of what plagiarism means, what fabrication means, and falsification. There isn't a real policy, national level policy. So this is, uh, realize this is a lot to do also with the institution part. So again, it's always, uh, both sides, the responsibility of the researchers and also the responsibility of the institutions. So the evidence immediately started pointing to the fact that there was fabrication. So further inquiries were made and yes, uh, it was concluded that there was fabrication. In fact, there was actually another author on the paper that, that uh, was published who was an international author in another country who was a statistician. So inquiries were made at his university and of him about what he understood about the data that was used in this published paper and he said, this is the data I received. So he had no, no knowledge that he had received fabricated data but he did the statistical analysis on the data that he had received. So this was a very serious case of fabrication of data uh, and it highlighted a number of issues um, which have been discussed here. First of all, um, where was the supervision in this case? But you'll notice that this is a very, very senior professor who formerly was the head of the department. Okay, highly respected, and it was most unusual that something like this should happen. And it wasn't expected of this particular person because they had 40 years of research career behind them. Okay, so nobody suspected that there was going to be anything wrong, um, but the, gathering the evidence, it showed that there was something wrong. The other issue that, that is in here, uh, which made life very difficult, well, first of all, the result of all the investigations was that the paper that was published was retracted and the university publicised the retraction very, very significantly in the local press. Okay, so everybody in the country knew that this paper had been retracted on the basis of the evidence which was very, very clear that the data had been fabricated. The next step that the university took was to undertake an investigation of previous publications by this senior professor. They found three or four more papers that they needed to retract based on the evidence. They then investigated the junior colleague and found several other papers there, both with the senior author as well as on his or her own. Uh, I've been very careful here <laughs> because there's one other point I need to point out and that is what was the underlying incentive for this to happen? The underlying incentive for this to happen was that the very senior professor was close to retirement the junior member of staff was potentially going to become the next director of the research centre, but that junior member of staff needed more publications on their record to be a credible director of the research centre. Okay, so the incentive was to fabricate some publications to get the publication list a little bit longer so that it made a credible appointment to replace the senior professor as the director of this research centre. I won't go into any other, other of the details except to point out that the very senior professor was male and the junior researcher was female. 
Is it significant? <laughs> Have a think about it. Just think about it. No, 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 no. Okay, so in the end, the procedure went through. It took quite a while. It was a very legalistic procedure, as you might imagine, in this circumstance. And just not too long before the Vice Chancellor of the University determined that there had been significant and serious research misconduct, the senior professor resigned from the university. Subsequent investigations of the junior person, they subsequently resigned as well. So they left the university. That was the penalty. They lost their jobs. Okay? So when you're talking about a punishment system here, that's where you end up uh, people losing their jobs. Kesen has already met uh, and from other university because it used to be uh, going fly away from the university and other university. And what is that the professor of psychology doing is he has, uh, he has fabricated the data of the questionnaire. So uh, he, he has a research in a school of the elementary school, but he's not doing a research by uh, really uh, interview the subject, but he's fabricated the data. And uh, who is the people who say to the ethic committee, uh, who's, who say something going on is uh, the, his PhD student. So two of his PhD students uh, feel not good with the data, but actually, yeah, it's quite a very highly uh, uh, cited professor, so that's why he's moved to our uh, university because uh, my university want to be have a higher rank. So he, uh, what is it, um, taken this professor from other university in the Netherlands. But the fabrication is already going on before he come to my university. It's already in other university. But the other problem because of there is already uh, one PhD graduated students that uh, used the use the data that is already retracted because after after the the complaint there is a very big a committee investigating and all of the paper who already uh, fabricated a statistic this is another question so I think it's so, many yeah this simply highlights the very very dangerous issues for people's careers particularly junior people when you have these sort of circumstances I know a few cases from Sweden uh, where they have uh, voluntarily resigned of various reasons I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this with you as a country which is emerging and uh, there might come up op opportunities in, in the future where um, you have the opportunity to host prestigious researchers but it's, it's something to be careful about. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of op opportunism around this too. Yeah? Yeah. If your work was based on an article that has been retracted, then... Yeah, I know, I know. So there's a, there's a lingering impact on your publication because it's based on work that had been retracted. Um, I'm, I'm really not going to answer that. That's really quite difficult and I'd really defer to other people who are more expert than me on that. Um, I think the, the bottom line here is that it is publicly known that the article, the offending article, has been retracted. It is also publicly known that your article is based on data from that retracted paper. Um, I'd suggest that there's probably no real need to retract your paper, depending on the strength of the link between the two pieces of work. Um, just in terms of the punishment and the fact that uh, researchers leave or are re resign or leave a university, uh, yes, it's possible they could be picked up by another unknowing institution. Um, but in the case that I talked about here, uh, that matter was referred to a government, not a government, an independent uh, body agency in Australia, which is known as the Crime and Misconduct Commission. Uh, and so the details of all of this have been handed to that, and that agency has the power to bring charges, criminal charges against somebody for wasting public money. So that the story is not yet finished in terms of the consequences of uh, research integrity being breached. I think we should finish off then with a list of 10 principles that you could think about in terms of how do you stop all of this. You'll never stop it. There will always be cases like these that come up from time to time, but you can minimise the risks. And there are very, some very simple things to do. Encourage the free flow of information. 
This is most important. One of the earliest slides that Adi put up was that uh, the statistics of how do these things come to light? How, are they how do they become known? And they usually become known because somebody, what we say in Australia and elsewhere is they blow the whistle. They make it public, okay? Or they, they raise the issue. They are a third party, uninvolved, but they raise a complaint. Uh, now, if you encourage the free flow of information and also establish transparency expectations, what, what all of this means is that if you have an open culture of research in your department, your school, your faculty, then the chances of something going wrong are diminished. Uh, <clears throat> and one way to do this is to make sure that you have a regular seminar series in your faculty where junior researchers and senior researchers, all of them, have the opportunity to present their work in progress as it's going on. Because if they're starting to fabricate something and they have to present that to a wider audience, then the risk of them being found out is higher. Okay, so if you have a culture of public exposure of the work that's going on, then uh, that can be a mitigating circumstance. And in fact, the example, the case four that we studied earlier was a case where there had been no public announcements about the research going on, no seminars given on the progress of the work and so on. So nobody knew about it. And that's why it became a problem. Uh, make scientific credentials part of hiring criteria, encourage scientists to communicate openly, which is the point I was just making. Uh, reinforce principles of whistleblower, whistleblower protection. And that is, uh, it's very difficult often for a whistleblower to blow the whistle because there's potential damage to their reputation. And there can be potential consequences if their circumstances are not managed appropriately. Uh, so we have to have very strong principles of whistleblower protection. Uh, training has been mentioned. Uh, in, encourage scientists to engage with communities of practice. That's the seminar series, for example, that I just talked about. Examine issues and correct any problems that arise. In other words, what this means is get on top of these issues very, very early, or as early as you possibly can. If there's a suspicion, then investigate them quickly and get the matter settled as quickly as you can. And finally, it comes down to best practice throughout the department, which again is founded on a set of principles, a set of policies, and a set of procedures in the department or the faculty or indeed the university as a whole, which everybody understands and know, and everybody else knows that everybody has to abide by those principles. So that's, uh, that's where we are there. Adi? Yeah, so I want to highlight again, uh, two parties are involved here, and I'm fully aware that it's also uh, my responsibility at the Faculty of Medicine to be able to create a safer atmosphere and safer culture for all the researchers. And I believe together with you and seeing all the enthusiasm that you've shown to us for the last three days, we could uh, help each other to, to make all these structures and mechanisms available in our institution. And also, it's a reminder for all of us, uh, because all of us are also researchers, that this these are the four key points that we need, we need to make sure and we need to spread the words about this to prevent, to assure research integrity, to report if that happens, and to report those who disagree with reporting research misconduct. This is also um, important. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, this is, um, in summary, um, yeah, you can read by yourself. Uh, character is always very important for the researcher. Uh, likewise, the institution, institution's character also <laughs> is also very important. So with this, uh, we would like to uh, end the session. And thank you for all of us for participating in, uh, in the discussion. And thank you.